Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You've been saved more than a week to know what it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. Well, that was sure appreciation. Come on. That ministered to me. Thank you, Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This is the words of Paul the Apostle. He says, therefore. Now, when that word therefore is in the Bible, you need to see what it's there for. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Can I just read that again? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, or she is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Father, will you bless the ministry and song we have just heard, Lord? My heart was blessed. My spirit was lifted. I was encouraged to praise you. Now, Lord, would you release your word? And would you let it find a lodging place in every one of our hearts, Lord. May we receive it in the love that it's given. And may your Son be revealed in all his reality and beauty. Lord, I pray that you'll stop us in our tracks and let us see Jesus in this church. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Listen to another translation, the Living Bible. When someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He's not the same anymore. A new life has begun. Jesus Christ changes lives. I think I got one amen there. Jesus Christ changes lives. I believe that with all of my heart. Remember when the communists were in power in Russia? Remember a speaker's corner, a communist was promoting communism. And he looked around the crowd and he saw a, a, drunk, a drunkard or a, a, a tramp standing at the side listening. And he pointed to the tramp and said, Communism? We'll put a new suit on that man. And a Christian listening shouted out, Aye, but Jesus Christ will put a new man in the new suit. <laughs> nah, it doesn't matter. Jesus Christ changes you from the inside out. Remember another open hour where a man was given his testimony how the Lord delivered him from drink and alcoholism. He used to spend his money on a Friday and go home and nothing to the wife and the children. The children were petrified of him. The wife argued with him. It was a terrible home, terrible situation. But someone invited him to a gospel service like this. He went along and he heard that Jesus Christ died to change his life and to forgive him of his sin and give him a future. He responded and now he's given his testimony. Of how Jesus lifted him out of the gutter of alcoholism and despair. And while he's preaching, there was a, crit a critic at the back shouted, Don't believe him. Don't believe him. It's all a dream. He's only dreaming. Don't believe him. It's a fake. And there was a wee girl standing beside him that you pulled the critic's coat. Excuse me, sir. If he's only dreaming, don't let him make up. Because that's my daddy. That's my God. Jesus Christ changes lives. I believe that. The man who penned these words. Here's another translation. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. 
the old life is gone and a new life has begun. The man who penned these words knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew what that change meant from his own personal experience. As I say in Scotland, it's better felt than told when it happens to you. Saul of Tarsus, anyone ever heard of him? If you have heard of him, lift your hand. Saul of Tarsus was a radical, patriotic, you want to call him paramilitary Jew, a religious zealot who believed 100% that he was right and everybody else was wrong. In fact, Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The many of us in Northern Ireland thought we were right, but we were wrong. So much so that he wanted to wipe out the name and the followers of Jesus from the face of the earth. He held the coats of the murderers or the men who stoned Stephen to death, the first Christian martyr in the early church. He hunted down Christians, arresting them and throwing them into prison, whether they were men or women. In fact, he was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. He had arrest warrants in his hand when he himself was arrested by Jesus Christ on the Damascus road. He was arrested. He was stopped in his tracks by the risen Lord. And falling off his horse to the ground, he cried out, Look, Who art thou, Lord? And the response was, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. And then he said this, Lord, what do you want me to do? He's surrendering to the one who's arresting him. And Jesus told him what to do. And his life changed. That day, everything changed for Saul of Tarsus. That day, Saul of Tarsus became a new creation or a new creature in Christ. His life was radically changed by Jesus, transformed, uh, made a brand new person from the inside out. In fact, Saul the persecutor actually became Paul the gospel preacher. I repeat, this man was radically changed by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ changes lives. Paul or Saul would never be the same again. The difference in his life was not only seen, it was heard and it was felt. Now I believe as a pastor and as a preacher of the greatest news in the world, the gospel, it is shameful if not sinful for any man or woman to profess to be in Christ, saved or born again while he's still unchanged in his heart and life. It is all about change. Jesus changes the direction of your life. When you repent, you turn away from the road of sin and you turn to the road of righteousness. He changes your lifestyle. Follow me and I will make you to become whatever. He wants to change you. He changes you, your vocabulary. Before I became a Christian, my mouth was a sewer. My mouth was a sewer. Especially on a football pitch. Every second word was F. Just the way of life. But the night he saved me, he took all that stuff away from me. And he gave me a new vocabulary. I love a laugh and a joke. But praise the Lord, it's different. He changes your desires. He changes your habits. Who would have thought that you would love to be in a prayer meeting? Who would have thought you'd love to be in a Bible study? Who would have thought you'd love to come to a gospel meeting and listen to two young lads singing? Sorry, two young fellas singing. Who would have thought that you'd be sitting in church tonight in the 21st century? He changes your desires and your habits. He changes your company. He takes you out of the wrong company and he gives you the right people around you. Can I hear an amen right there? And he changes your destination. Glory to God. We were bound for hell. They were bound for heaven. Come on, let's give him the glory. That's why I 
say if there's no change, there's no conversion. If there's no change, then there's no salvation. How do you know? Because of what Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We must let go of the old in order to experience and enjoy the new. The gospel is all inclusive. Do you know something? It's for everybody in this service. If anyone, look at the person beside you say, that includes you and me. If anyone, any man or woman, that includes anyone and everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what they are, rich, poor, wise, ignorant, black, white, young, old, Protestant, Catholic, Jew, Arab, the gospel of Jesus Christ is all inclusive. It's for anyone. But it's also exclusive. Because of anyone be in Christ. Now here's the second thing. To experience the change, you've got to be in Christ. To experience the transformation, you must come to Christ. Believe in Christ. Accept Jesus Christ and follow Jesus Christ. Paul declares in Christ 170 times in his writings in the New Testament. To be born again, saved, forgiven, to become a new person or a Christian, you must be in Christ. The gospel is exclusive. You've got to be in Christ if you want change. He's the one that does the changing. Thirdly, the gospel is a new beginning. If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. A new creation or a new creature. Not a repair job. Not a patch up job. Not a makeover. But a brand new person from the inside. Can I hear an amen out there? The gospel is a new beginning. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only a beginning. Listen, it's an ending and then a new beginning. Because he says, all things pass away. And all things become new. It's life transforming. All things, all habits, all sins, all lifestyles, all haunts pass away. They're gone and they're to be gone for good. And behold, all things become new. It's a new life. It's a new life. Now let me explain. A new life. Jesus Christ changes lives. If he's changed yours, lift your hand. Jesus Christ. Jesus walked along the shores of Galilee at the beginning of his ministry. He saw fishermen. Some were casting a net. Some were mending a net. He looked at them and he said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. They were fishers. They were fishermen. But he called them. It says immediately they forsook their nets and followed him. Their lives were changed from that moment. They were fishermen, but they became fishers of men. And I look at the people tonight, and you have been changed by Jesus. He wants to make you a fisher of men, but you have to follow him. He changed these fishermen. He then also, in the same chapter, Mark 1, he goes into Peter's mother-in-law's house. Peter's mother-in-law. Listen, if anybody needed change, it's probably the mother-in-law. I am so glad and privileged that I led my mother-in-law to Jesus. That's a privilege I have. And you know something? She's in glory tonight because of that moment. But Peter's mother-in-law was ill. And so they told, told him about her. He went to Peter's house, went in, took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her. And listen, she then served him. Jesus changed her and then she served him. See, when he changes you, you want to serve him. You want to give something back. You don't want to walk away and just be selfish. When he saves you, when he changes you, when he heals you, you want to give him something back. You want to give back gratitude. 
and she served him. Then in the same chapter, he, he's a, approached by a leper, the untouchables of society. Nobody wanted to touch him because they contaminate the coronavirus. What do you call it? The coronavirus. Nobody wanted to touch him because when you touch the leper, then you became contaminated. He touched the leper and he made him clean. He touched this man with a dreaded disease. You know, the Bible says, lay hands on the sick. What's the Christian church going to do now? And we're not allowed to lay hands on the sick. And we're not going to take a chance. Or we're not going to trust God. Surely, my goodness, if he's the healer, he'd help us. Amen. Would you say amen to that? We're going to have to lay hands on the sick. Oh, I wouldn't touch them. What do you mean you wouldn't touch them? Jesus touched them. Amen. Oh, pastor, what do you want to do now? I don't know. I'm just going to lay hands on the sick. Jesus touched the untouchable. And his life was changed. He began to be brought back into society again. Why? Because Jesus cleansed him of leprosy. In Mark chapter 5, what about this one? He enters a graveyard. There's a man living in a graveyard by the name of Legion. This man was tormented by 6,000 evil spirits in his life. He opened the door of his heart and his life to evil and 6,000 demons. In fact, they stripped him naked. He was naked living in this graveyard. He was among the dead. He lived among the dead. He was a social misfit. He was cutting himself. He was self-harming. Does that sound familiar in the 21st century? It's happening all around us. Here's a man. And he's uncontrollable. He's breaking chains. They're trying to bind him. And he pulls the chains apart. He's untamable. Nobody can tame this one. He's unrestrainable. He's unsociable. Everybody's frightened of him. And he's unconsolable. He cries every night when he's coupled himself. And Jesus walked into his life. And changed him. The man who was uncontrollable and unsociable and unconsolable when the people came back to see what happened he's clothed he took away his nakedness he clothed his shame do you need your shame clothed tonight do you need forgiven of all that he's clothed he's in his right mind and he's actually sitting at the feet of jesus what a change what a change what a change he delivered him Legion. Not only did he deliver him, but he sent them out to ten cities to give us testimony and to tell everybody what Jesus had done in his life. Isn't it amazing? Here was once a slave of Satan, and now he's a servant of God, preaching the gospel to ten communities. Oh, that's amazing. Come on, well, let's give the Lord the glory. Is that not exciting? What about this one? I'm just talking about how Jesus changed his lives. And the best way to look at it is in the here. Because that the Bible, the gospel's full of it. Full of examples. John chapter 5. Jesus walks into the place called the pool of Bethesda. How many people know what Bethesda means? It means house of mercy. And when he walked in, there was a multitude of sick people waiting on waters to trouble so that they could get in and get healed. Listen, the house of mercy had become a house of misery. A house of mercy had become a house of misery. Sick people all around this pool, like the, the modern day lures. It's the same, the modern day lure, they're waiting for healing. The house of mercy had become a house of misery. But Jesus walked in to this house of misery and he spoke a word into one man's life. Well, I'll tell you something. You may be that one man here tonight. You may be that one woman sitting here tonight. And he's going to speak into your life. And listen to what he said. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? This man was lying there for 38 years. 38 years. And listen to what he says. The important man. He said, I have no one to help me. Into the water. What a shame. I have no man to help me into the water. 38 
years sitting beside that pool waiting for somebody to help him and sadly 38 years still later no one was willing to help him all oh, the loneliness of sickness nobody understands what they're going through unless they've been through it themselves all oh, the loneliness of sickness but Jesus speaks a word into his life that man was lonely for 38 years until Jesus walked into his life hey, that's pretty good and he speaks and what does he do he says rise take up your bed and walk immediately the man took up his bed and went out Jesus changed this impotent man's life forever he healed this paralyzed man he spoke a word in his paralyzed life. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Jesus took him off his bed and put him on his feet. He can take you off your back and put you on your feet. If you only listen and obey. That important par a paralyzed cripple, unknown, lonely man arose from his misery and walked into a new life. A new tomorrow. And you destiny. My God. Can I say it again? Jesus Christ changes lives. He changes lives. Thinking of Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Levi. Not we Levi at the back. Is he there? Where is he? Levi, no. This man was a corrupt tax collector. Sitting at his tax office desk. Calling people. Milking people. Abusing people. Yet Jesus walks by and he said two words, follow me. That's all he said, follow me. Immediately, Levi rose up, locked up his booth and followed Jesus. Aye, and promises to pay back fourfold all the people he called. What about that for transformation? Amen. In fact, Jesus changed Levi from being a crooked thief to a gospel recorder, Levi, it's actually Matthew. And the gospel of Matthew was written by him. Jesus changes lives. Can I hear an amen? What about the woman caught in adultery? John chapter 8. The religious leaders bring her and they throw her down in front of Jesus. And they're telling him, according to the law, she's been committing adultery and she's to be stoned to death. What do you think? They were trying to trap Jesus. They didn't care about her. They were only using her as bait to trap Jesus. But Jesus kept writing on the ground. What do you think? What do you think? And he looked up at them and he said, He that is without sin, cast the first stone. And nobody moved. Do you know why? Because nobody could cast the first stone. The only person who could cast the first stone was him because he was sinless. And one by one they walked away, dropped their stones and walked away. He says, there words your accusers. He says, I haven't got any, but any. He says, well, neither do I can they Listen to this. Go and sin no more. Did you hear that? Go and sin no more. In other words, live different. Don't go out and do the same things again. Listen, when Jesus changed you, you don't want to do those things anymore. You want to please him. Live different. Live clean. Live right. And she did. Oh my goodness. As I finish this week bit. <laughs> what about the thief on the cross? Pastor, there were two thieves. Are you right? And they worked there for stealing sweets. They were condemned to death beside him. One on either side. One died cursing him. The other died calling on him. The one who called said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus replied, Today, you will be with me in paradise. This man was on his way to hell. A lost eternity. Without God and without hope. But he called out to Jesus before he died. And Jesus took him from the road to hell and promised him a place in heaven. 
That's the one that I serve when I know. He's merciful in his judgment. And he is amazing with his grace. If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation or a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In the People's Church Newton Abbey, we preach Jesus Christ changes lives. The one who left heaven, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless, spotless life, who began a ministry of healing the sick, raising the dead, forgiving sinners, the one who was betrayed, arrested, mocked, crucified, and then buried in a tomb, three days later rose from the dead, and he's still alive tonight in this service. And the amazing thing is, he's here for you. You ever heard of a man called John Wagner? Jay Fallon? Steve Derbyshire? Paul Lloyd? I know all these men. All of them were heroin addicts and drug barns. Neither pastors or churches. Kevin Keenan was from Grangemouth in Scotland. He used to come to our church. I sent him down to Victory Outreach Rehab three times. He left, couldn't stick it, and bailed out three times. And then he would come back to church. The heroin up. Says, Pastor, give me an hour chance. I says, Well, you need to wait. Sent them back the fourth time. And he stayed. Today, he's the manager of the rehab. He's the manager of the rehab. Brian Miles. We had people giving their testimony in our church. Brian Miles, he was from Grange Mount Poo. He came to hear them giving their testimony of how Jesus could change them. He raised his hand in our service. He walked to the front. He was carrying a Tesco bag. He says, I want Jesus and I want change. I need to go to this rehab. I spoke to the pastor, Paul Lloyd, said, will you get him in sort of? He says, yes, I will. He said to him, listen, go home and get your stuff, get a case, whatever it is, and bring, come back, get all your possessions and come back. He says, these are my possessions. A Tesco bag. Brought him with him to rehab. Today, he's the manager of a Christian bookshop. And he married a girl from the church because she also was an alcoholic and she did see it. And now they've got a wee baby child, a wee child and they're living for Jesus down in Manchester. We're just saying the end of that. Why am I saying these things? Chip McCurry. Anybody ever heard of Chip McCurry? Chip McCurry's daddy was shot dead by the IRA. And as a wee boy, the next day he went and joined the UVF, got a gun, went out and shot a Catholic. He was sentenced to life in the maze prison. I met him personally. No one will know him. Chip McCurry heard the gospel give his life to Jesus. When he was released, he went into Bible college. He's a pastor of a Baptist church in Liverpool. Serving Jesus Christ. Served his time, but he's now serving Jesus. Jesus Christ changes lives. Can I hear an amen? Hugh Brown. Hugh Brown was charged with me. There was four of us charged with a, a part of what one of my offenses. <laughs> and anyway, we disappeared for a few years. Thought we were right, but we're just wee boys being manipulated and used. And Hugh Brown was moved to compound 18. I was in compound 21. He came down one day, six months before we were released. He says, Jordan, I need to see you. Came to the wire. I says, yes, what is it, Hugh? Or Hughie. He says, I've got to say this is beat it. He says, I'm telling you, I've got to say. I says, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. What do you how did you get saved in here? He says, I was watching the film Ben Hur. I don't even seen Ben Hur. It's on every Easter anyway. And at the end of it, it shows you the crucifixion. He says, my mom and dad are Christians, Jordan. They've been praying for me for years. He says, when I saw the crucifixion, I got up on my seat, went into my cubicle, fell on my knees and asked Jesus Christ in the moment. 
I said, well, all the best. You may be, all the best. Maybe someday I have the guts to do what you've done. He says, well, I'm a friend. I said, no, don't want you to pray for me. Maybe someday. So as soon as he walked away from me, see in here, I felt an emptiness in my life. And I knew that I needed Jesus. Hugh left the prison with me uh, six months later. He went, went to Bible college. He's been a missionary in Japan for 40 years. And the Japanese government have given him the freedom to go into every prison in Japan and tell a story how Jesus Christ changed his life. Don't tell me God can't. These people tell me God can't. Real lives, real stories, real people. And here's the good news for you. This is an unbelievable invitation. If anyone, if anyone be in Christ, it's an unchangeable requirement. You've got to be in Christ. It will produce an unmistakable change. They are a new creation or a new creature, a brand new person from the inside. And it has an undeniable proof because the old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. That's the joy of knowing Jesus. The two men that we have ministered in song tonight, Jordy and Noel, add to this sermon. Add to this sermon. Jordy gets saved in the Crumlin Road in a cell. Called on Jesus and he saved them. And he used to sing around the pubs and the clubs. Now he sings for Jesus. What a transformation. <laughs> Noel Large. If you take the time to go on to YouTube and type in Noel Large, you will know that he was one of the most feared people in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. Look at him now. What's he doing? He used to sing loyalist songs. So he did. Now he's singing for Jesus. <laughs> Phil Thompson sitting here. Two years ago this month, he was out of his head in cocaine. Jesus Christ saved him. Brought back his children to him. And they love their dad now. What a testimony. I have to tell you. He went to the Alpha to pay his dad. Anybody know the Alpha? No. Anyway, he went to the Alpha to pay his dad. One of the men who receives the dad, he says, where are you? He says, I'm, I'm, I've got saved. He says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to the people's church. Jordy McKim, tell Jordy we still have the wallets that he made for us in the cash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear Lord. He changes you. Come on. He can change you. We can laugh. But you know something? Jesus enters the school of no hopers. The school of messed ups. The hopeless cases. And now he makes them ambassadors for Jesus. Examples to follow. And inspiring other people. If he can change them, he can change anybody. If anyone, and I'm finished, no matter who you are, what you are, where you're from, or what you've done, Jesus Christ can change your life. He takes away your old, and he gives you a new one. He takes your broken life, and he makes it brand new. He takes your mess, and he can turn it into a miracle. The bottom line is, you have to let him. You have to let him. We all have a past. If you have a past, let your hand. We all have a past. My old life has passed away. My old life is under the blood of Jesus. My old life is gone. I'm forgiven. I'm a new creation. All because Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. We all have a past. My question as I close this little sermon tonight is, what are you doing 
with your past? Are you letting it hold you back? Are you letting it cripple you? Are you letting it paralyze you? Are you letting it keep you from coming to Jesus? Don't let your past rob you of a brilliant future. Don't let the enemy, don't give your past to Jesus. Because we all have a future. We all have a future and we, what we do with Jesus now will determine where we spend our future. What we do with Jesus now will determine what he will do with us in the future. Will he say to you on that day when you stand before him, depart from me and never knew you? Or will he say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thy in to the joy of the Lord. You see, I'm finishing just now. You're going to leave the service tonight one way or the other. With him or without him. You're going to leave the people's church tonight rejecting him or accepting him. That's it. You can't do both. No man can serve two masters. You've got to serve one or the other. If you're a new creation, leave the old things behind. Don't try and bring them with you. Let them go. If anyone be in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are passed away and people all things. Jesus can take a drunkard like my dad and make him a sober man. He can take a prostitute and make her a godly woman. He can take a drug addict and let him live clean. He can take a thief and make him a good citizen. Look around you tonight. Listen to the news. Everything's falling apart. Everything's caving in. Everything's breaking down. But Jesus is here. And he's here for you. He's here for you. The question is, will you put your trust in him? He can heal your marriage. He can heal your relationships. He can forgive you of all your sin. And he can set you free. If he can do it for all these, he can do it for you. What do you allow? Well, that's it. Let's just put it in prayer.